Hi, I'm Siri. Welcome to Do Lunch Online. We're at the Frank H. McClung Museum located on the University of Tennessee campus in Knoxville, Tennessee. The presentation today is 
Archaeology and the Native Peoples of Tennessee Native Americans have lived in what is now Tennessee for at least 12,000 years. Here, especially in river valleys, they found resources on which to build lives and societies. In 1933, the Tennessee Valley Authority was created and began plans to construct dams along many of those rivers to produce electrical power and reduce flooding. They and others realized that impounded waters would cover and perhaps destroy the material record and history of the region. And so, at sites destined for flooding, federal jobs programs and a maturing science called Archaeology teamed up to find and preserve evidence of ancient societies. The University of Tennessee was a key player in that effort, recovering the material recorded, interpreting its stories, and sharing them with the public. Here, you can view the fruit of that work and experience the story of Tennessee's native peoples. Paleo-Indian period. Human populations were lightly scattered across the area that is now Tennessee during the Paleo-Indian period. From more than 12,000 to 10,000 years ago, people adapted to an environment that was changing from Ice Age to modern. Besides stone tools, more durable than most materials, little evidence remains for archaeologists to find. Archaeologists generally agree that people entered North America from Northeast Asia, when, continues to fuel debate. Recent discoveries in South America place people in Chile 12,500 years ago, which would suggest an even earlier immigration from Asia, because glaciers blocked the land route into interior North America from about 21,000 to 12,000 years ago. The first Americans either followed a coastal route that led them ultimately to the tip of South America, or they arrived earlier, before those glaciers formed. Some scientists have used studies of genetic and linguistic diversity of living Native Americans to postulate multiple migrations and time scales. On the other hand, some Native Americans believe their people have always lived here. Projectal points are distinctively shaped, chipped stone tools used as spear points, knife blades and arrowheads. Archaeologists define projectile point and other artifact types by the particular size, shape and other characteristics a group of artifacts shares. Certain artifact types are linked to a particular time period or culture, providing archaeologists with a rough way to date sites. The distinctive features of points made during the Paleo-Indian period includes flutes, single long flakes removed from each side of the point. The names Clovis, Cumberland and Dalton, given to certain projectile points, are type names. Clovis points are the earliest and Dalton points, the latest, archaic period. People still lived in extended family groups in the archaic period, but moved about less than in the Paleo-Indian period. They spent more time in established communities, and traveled seasonally to camps from which they hunt or gather food. Family sizes probably increased as women bore children more often, or more infants survived. Religion and ceremony are not the same thing. Religion is a set of beliefs. Ceremony a system of ritualistic behavior. Archaeologists have found evidence of archaic period rituals, but the content of these pursuits is not known. Humans acknowledge death with ritual and ceremony. The earliest burials in Tennessee date to the early Archaic period. About 9,000 years ago, people placed objects with the dead, possibly to memorize a person or identify his or her social role, or to accompany the deceased into an afterlife. Archaeologists find burials scattered through base camps. By the end of the Archaic period some groups used special cemeteries away from the living areas. People made tubular pipes during the Archaic period, but archaeologists have no evidence that people smoked them. Celebrants may have blown objects or substances from pipes or drawn breaths through them during special ceremonies. People exchanged ideas, materials and even finished items. Soapstone from nearby Georgia or far away as New England was carved into bowls, odd lot weights and pipes. 
Marine shells from either the Gulf of Mexico or the Atlantic Ocean were crafted into pendants, beads and containers. Copper from the faraway shores of Lake Superior or from a closer sources in North Carolina and Tennessee was cold hammered into sheets that were rolled to make beads, or cut to make ornaments. Woodland period. Stonework, pottery making and weaving continued to develop through the woodland period. People erected structures and excavated storage facilities as they stayed longer in specific locations. The bow and arrow joint the otlatl and spear in the kit of the woodland hunter. Trade involved economic exchange, gifts and favors. Although we are uncertain of the scale and schedule of woodland period trade, we do know that materials moved from one area to another, from one people to another, and among regions near and far. Some trade items were used in ritual and some constituted wealth and status. Pottery, initially appearing during the Archaic period, became common in the Woodland period. Everyday use of bulky and breakable ceramic vessels for cooking, eating and storing was possible because of the more settled lifestyle of the Woodland period. Woodland period people created pipes, effigies and adornments to connect them with their spiritual lives a connection we can appreciate even if we can't know the nature of their beliefs. They also built large earthworks, including ceremonial and burial mounds, which reflect aspects of their beliefs. Open areas and regularly disturbed refuse-enriched soils around human settlements provided habitat preferred by some native seed-bearing plants. People protected and harvested them, and stored and replanted their seeds. Thus the relationship between people and a limited number of food plants intensified. During the woodland period, people in Tennessee also began to cultivate maize, a native of Mexico. Although people continued to hunt, fish and gather a wide variety of wild plant foods, they focused more and more on a small group of highly productive plants. Mississippian period. Farming flourishes. Agriculture the science and art of producing food crops, intensified. During the Mississippian period, people tilled soil, sowed seeds, tended the growing plants, and harvested them. Native peoples in the South, East focused on corn, making this plant a cornerstone of Mississippian societies. Indeed, many aspects of Mississippian culture were linked to corn cultivation. Ironically, when Mississippian period people developed an agriculture that produced abundant food, their health suffered, anemia became more common, and diet caused weakness left people prone to infections and other diseases. These conditions left characteristic markers on the skeleton and teeth. Complex settlement systems developed, focused on corn agriculture, leaders emerged, Chiefs with power connected to spiritual sources are reinforced by ideology and special status objects. These chiefs presided over large populations and their economic, social and religious activities. Status may have been inherited, probably along matrilineal lines. How do we know? Young people buried with elite items, long before they could have earned status on their own. Rituals and ceremonies and the arts related to them, flourished during the Mississippian period. On town plazas and temple mounds people held ceremonies to ensure or celebrate successful planting and abundant harvests. Rituals also were conducted for special occasions and to bury the dead. Iconography, the use of symbols to impart specific meanings, developed through the Mississippian period. Icons appeared on pottery, pipes or cave walls but they are especially common as engraved designs on shell gorgets worn as pendants on the chest. How do archaeologists know what the icons mean? Similar symbols appear in works by later tribes. Historic period. Native Americans in the southeast are descendants of Mississippian cultures, some native peoples living along the Atlantic and Gulf coasts, and perhaps the interior became early casualties of European contact moving, vanishing or being absorbed into larger groups by 1700. 
Once Europeans became frequent visitors to the region after 1700 Native Americans began to be identified by names we use today, Europeans recognize more than 180 groups throughout the southeast. Only about 50 are shown on this map. The Creeks, more than 10 distinctive groups who spoke closely related languages, were the largest group in the southeast, before European contact. Some of their ancestors may have lived in Tennessee. Members of the Natchez, Shawnee and Uchi were incorporated into Creek and Cherokee cultures in the 18th century. Several remnant Creek-related groups formed a new group, the Seminole, that by early 19th century, lived in parts of Florida once home to the Timucula and Calusa. The Cherokee developed strategies to adapt to changes brought by European settlement. They made the adjustments they found convenient and expedient, while maintaining their own culture. Increasing pressure from Euro-American settlements, though, forced them to choose sides in political and military conflicts. The Cherokee asked the British to build a fort to help defend the region against the French and their Indian allies. In 1756 the British established Fort Loudoun on the banks of the Little Tennessee River. As the colonists rebelled against English rule, the Cherokee, fearful that victorious Americans would take over their lands, sided with the British. But, the British proved unable to protect and supply their Cherokee allies. American militias repeatedly destroyed Cherokee towns, some of which were never reoccupied. Cherokee culture began changing at contact with Europeans. This change, called acculturation, was reflected in values, beliefs and material objects. It became most dramatic after the American Revolution. There were no longer any large Cherokee towns. Cherokee people began adopting aspects of Euro-American lifestyles. Indians had to abide by federal government policy, the aim of which was to civilize Native Americans, or move them west. Nonetheless, the Cherokee managed to maintain their unique identity. People in the Overhill Cherokee towns in Tennessee interacted with the British, French, and Spanish as European exploration and settlement moved west. Yet many Cherokee traditions remain intact in the colonial years.